I'm joined today by Shashank Shakar, construction innovator, CEO of Miko, transforming the way India builds. Uh, today, I'd like to talk with you about how you started your company, Miko, and your visions for how it can disrupt and change the uh, old, tired industry of construction. Uh, thank you, Jared. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you. So, uh, I'll just briefly introduce myself and my co. Uh, so, uh, I'm a graduate in civil engineering and also uh, I was pursuing my PhD in 3D concrete printing itself. Uh, so, like after we did our initial research on 3D printing materials, uh, machinery, automation parts, uh, then I along with my few uh, co-founders, uh, two co-founders, Ankita and Rishabh, uh, who are also studying there at IIT Gandhinagar. So, we decided that this is something which is going to change the way construction is done. So we decided to uh, take a leap ahead and start our venture, MyCorp. So uh, in our initial phases, uh, so MyCorp, uh, when we started this, uh, like around four years back, four and a half years back, so our original intent was that there are certain specific areas in construction where uh, you have very difficult uh, working environment. Uh, it's very, uh, for example, MyCorp is primarily working in defense sector uh, as on today. So uh, for India, so there is a very tough geoclimatic condition for its border areas. So uh, there, if you look at the bunkers, the shelters which are built there, and the way they have been built for more than uh, like 70 years uh, as of today, so that was very challenging. Like we have altitudes ranging from uh, 20,000 feet, and we have uh, desert areas with where you have temperature ranges uh, exceeding 50 degrees Celsius. So these are some of the things which uh, had been in the back of our mind and we wanted to contribute in some ways where uh, we can actually uh, increase the quality of construction the way they are done. So we, uh, when we started this thing, so uh, at MyCorp we had this thing in mind that with the given design freedom, with the new tech uh, that uh, we have with us, we should be able to solve problems instead of just developing a technology. So the whole intent of MyCorp is to actually solve problems using technology. So we have been focusing on products uh, which uh, are solving problems for the clients. And uh, so far uh, our four year journey has been focused on this only. Like uh, we have been very, uh, primarily we are working on a code development stage, uh, code development basis only. Like it's not like we are creating products and then selling them in the market. We are trying to listen to the customer client uh, where they actually are uh, facing some problems and then trying to help uh, with uh, the technology that is available with us and with their guidance as well. So we are trying to leverage whatever 3D printing uh, can offer in terms of design freedom, in terms of optimization of uh, various panels, in terms of uh, portability, in terms of relocatability. So these are some of the features that we are trying to focus on uh, as we grow. And this has been, I would say, a rewarding journey so far. And uh, because uh, there are very few companies, I would say, which have been able to work at such uh, extreme conditions where we have been fortunate to move. Like we have, uh, I would say, developed bunkers uh, at like almost 18,000 feet uh, height uh, in India where the temperature goes uh, like below 40 degrees Celsius as well in negative. Wow. We have uh, developed bunkers in like desert areas where uh, you cannot, cannot move because of the sand dunes. So we have created products which can be taken at those locations and then you can actually now construct in like two days, three days time. So that's something uh, which we have been fortunate uh, to actually uh, work on jointly with defense. Wow, well there's a lot to unpack there. The materials it sounds like at such different, with such different parameters you'd want different ingredients but maybe we can get to that in a little bit. Uh, yeah. The, I like the way you described your company as working with software, working with your customers to get through some of the R&D phases, figuring out solutions to the problems. A lot of the companies sell their product as a kind of like the way Apple wants to sell an iPad, where you take it out of the box and press the buttons and download whatever apps you want. Uh, it's not that simple. And so the, some early customers of companies that aren't so transparent like you've just been end up struggling in the beginning when they realize it's not just press go and there's actually skills they need to learn to be able to operate the equipment. Uh, how do you educate customers and hold their hand through that process? Uh, so uh, basically, 
in that is a very i would say critical thing and important thing because from a customers or a clients point of view uh, what they are looking for is a solution so technology is one thing and then they are uh, actually trying to involve the technology to solve their problems so primarily to uh, take them through this journey is something where we have to definitely educate them understand uh, make them understand like what can be done what can be the scope of the work that we can do what not and then uh, when we have a very clear picture then we uh, go into the final stages of how we are going to execute the things uh, for example uh, when we are working with defense or other clients so first thing uh, primarily is like we educate them about what are the possible options of building uh, something with 3d printing technology like we have multiple modes of construction that can be possible like uh, we as on today are working primarily on i would say as a prefab concrete printing mode so we are not operating as a on site construction uh, method we are primarily oper uh, operating as a prefab construction method so in that case primarily uh from from a building point of view so there are certain aspects like uh, you have foundation then you have the walls then you have the roofing and then all the finishing internal plumbing electrification other things so uh in few of our projects what we have been able to do is to incorporate footing uh, walls and slabs all as a 3d printed component so that is uh, one case but there are certain disadvantages and certain advantages that we have for specific cases and otherwise there are specific cases where we ask the clients to make either the footing and then we can do the walls and then the roofing can be done as a conventional method so it basically boils down to one thing like how to optimize the cost for the client at the end because we have to optimize cost we have to optimize time uh and we have to ensure that things are delivered uh in a fashion as we have kind of jointly discussed uh, together with the client so uh, primarily uh there uh, if we are uh, talking about educating the customer so there are certain aspect that we have to educate them on like what is the material that we are going to use what would be the type of finish that they are going to have what can be done like if we are going to do the footing uh, using 3d printing technology so primarily as on today normally what is done you are just creating form work basically so if you are going to create footing so primarily to be kind of form work then you have to do the grouting on site or this can be done as at our factory so all these things have to be very transparent with the client so that we try to educate them as much as possible and they in terms of wall system so there are multiple ways either walls can be no load bearing uh, or the walls can be reinforced and uh, as a load bearing component as well so that uh, and we can have a system or a structural system where the conventional rcc column or steel columns can be used as a load bearing member and then the 3d printed walls can be used as a non load bearing component or we can have a combination as well so there are multiple options so for that what we have we have a design team which uh, first of all educates the client like what are the multiple options that we can work out the solution uh, in consideration with the client and then once we agree on to something like uh, this is how they want to build because there are multiple ways uh like let's say if the client is able to do footing uh in uh, their domain or in their area by themselves uh, rapidly compared to if we uh, do the footing in our factory so that way they, we can uh, further save on time so that way we for first define the scope of the work and then we take on to various uh, printing uh i would say printing parts or printing components for the building and then uh the rest of the things like the electrical plumbing all those things have to be accounted in our detailed designing so once we do the shop drawing we discuss with the clients like this is how it's going to be uh, we uh, try to create the visualizations for them so that they can understand if there is something which needs to be modified or not but yes uh, with 3d printing uh, there are certain advantages that we have that we can do rapid i would say prototyping as well like if uh, a client is uh, willing to uh, try to know how the building would come up Uh, so we can have a very good uh, visualizations for that we can have very good uh, samples done as well uh, at a smaller scale so that client uh, becomes more comfortable with the finish of the product with the quality of the product that they are going to have <clears throat> nice i saw on your website you have a picture of a building with vertical lines uh implying that it was tilted up rotated 90 degrees uh it has a lift at the bottom is that the footing 
Yeah, so we have done a few structures what, where what we have done is where we have T-shaped uh, structures, so T-shaped panels. So mm -hmm. the bottom uh, of that panel, bottom of the T, so it's an inverted T. So what happens, the inverted T uh, becomes the footing. So we just have to do the excavation. We have to do the soiling, uh, uh, strengthen the soil, uh, and then uh, you do the PCC, plain cement concrete, and then you can uh, directly place the panels onto the PCC uh, by having an adhesive layer between the PCC and the footing and then that acts as your foundation. So that is also one way but there are certain disadvantages in that because then the structure becomes very heavy. So mm -hmm. the cost can go up because the transportation uh, is again uh, becoming a challenge but the speed of construction is very fast in that mode. Interesting. And your printer is a robotic arm system, correct? We have both. We have robotic arms system, we have gantry type system as well. So our first system was gantry type, then we moved on to robotic system, so we have both uh, as on today. And using both, which do you prefer in what circumstances? Uh, so we, uh, I would say, prefer robotic arm uh, for specific applications like uh, when we are printing some complex shapes, where we have to do very intricate shapes where the turnings are too much. Uh, also where we need higher speeds without affecting much of the quality. So their robotic systems are what we find are more suitable because they have less vibrations and they can uh, move at a very higher speed as well. And uh, when we need a very large structure, single structure, there where we need a bigger envelope, uh, printing envelope. So there we generally go with the uh, gantry type and generally the structures which do not have much of the turnings I would say primarily say where you do not have very sharp turns much uh, intricacies so their gantry systems uh, work quite good. Mm -hmm. And how long ago did you and your team develop your first gantry system? Uh, we developed our first system uh, around in 2017 so that was basically a lab scale system so mm -hmm. that was primarily for research purpose. Uh, so in 2017, we started our research using that system which we built at IIT Gandhinagar. And then uh, we built our mid-scale 3D printing system uh, in around 2020 when the COVID uh, was there. So from 2017 to 20, it was primarily the research on materials, uh, research on software. Because uh, when we look at the materials, so that is something which is very critical from, a, I would say, a sustainability point of view. Because uh, I'll give you an example of... Uh, using high alumina cement so like somewhere around in 1940 1950 so high alumina cement or alumina cement was very becoming very famous so uh, the reason was that alumina cement uh, is something it which can attain like 30 mp 35 mp strength in a single day so in that time it was becoming very famous because people were able to deshutter the foam work within a day and they were able to uh, do the casting very fast and they were actually turn around the whole uh, form work and shuttering very fast but like uh, alumina based concrete is something which is uh, not stable because like when it further hydrates like after two three years five years down the line when it further hydrate it transforms into a more stable form which actually is not uh, of the exact shape or size as the first one which was there during the first mm -hmm. hydration so those structures started to fail like five years ten years down the line so then what happened, people started to realize that alumina cement is something uh, which cannot be used and then all the buildings uh, which were made using alumina cement were either discarded, destroyed and now alumina cement is only used as a refractory cement. So that is one thing. So we have to be very uh, thorough while developing a materials because we can create materials which can strengthen very fast using certain things uh, which can be added there. but. It's not just about a year or something. It's something we are building for like 50 years, 100 years or maybe more. So it's not just something which we are looking for a year or two years time frame. We have to look in decades and we have to ensure that we learn from the mistakes that have been done in the past and then we build on to things which are sustainable and durable. Yeah, that's a very powerful analogy. And uh, it's good now there are a lot of companies printing houses around the world, hopefully with different materials so that uh, we can <laughs> learn from some of the lessons. In the beginning, there was concern. There were so few printed homes. The people who were printing them were very worried that someone may print one without going through the right engineering precautions. And if it collapsed or crumbled, it would be a negative uh, impact on the perception of the whole industry. Uh, but now I think there's so many 
that I, it might be able to, if one were to have an issue, it maybe wouldn't be a big deal. But if every single project uh, or a lot of them used a similar material that had some longevity issues, uh, that could certainly be troubling. True. Yeah, I, definitely there are a quite uh, good scientists uh, who have been working in this. So there has been a lot of research, a lot of R&D in 3D concrete printing domain since Bero Khoshnevich, Dr. Bero Khoshnevich started this in like mm -hmm. 2014, way back then. So there have been quite good developments in this field. There have been a lot of new additives that have been uh, considered a uh, new kind of materials. So yeah, things look pretty good. But yeah, we have to be very cautious while uh, actually going ahead. Yeah, I'm uh, a little hesitant to announce this before it happens, but I'm actually supposed to have Barack on the podcast in a couple oh. weeks. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> yeah, I'm nice. excited to see his, uh, I mean, 2017 is a long time since you started, but he started like decades ago. It's uh, He has a wild perspective. True. I think they um, are actually now printing with actual concrete. They are printing with like... 20 mm or 16 mm aggregate. So that's something which is going to be again quite interesting to learn and see uh, how that is going to be adopted in this. That domain. being said, there's a couple Miko buildings out there around the world. I don't know of any contour crafting printed buildings yet. <laughs> but uh, definitely, if you look at Chinese bamboo tree that actually grows for five years below the ground, then one mm. day you see that it's like just going up, uh, like. Uh, hundreds of fit like in just few uh, months so definitely uh, there have been a lo lot of research which uh, dr behro has been doing yeah yeah so when you first got to printing i'm sure you quickly learned the how important the mixing pump systems are true the true. printer is what gets all the clicks on the internet i think people are much more fascinated by it but the it's much less complex uh what kind of mixing system did you start with and how has that evolved to today uh, when we started uh, in the research phase, so we had a very simple extruder uh, like which we developed ourselves. So it was a screw kind of a pumping system where we used to mix our material in a separate uh, kind of a mixer, pan mixer, and then we used to pour the material to that hopper. So mm -hmm. from there we learned how the things are done. Then we switched on to kind of a combination of a continuous mixer and which was coupled with a kind of a progressive screw cavity pump. So that was the next stage uh, that we went into and now we are using a kind of a combined system which is generally uh, provided by Amtech. Uh, so that's uh, presently we are using, so which is working quite good. So we also have few other pumps that we have actually been developing as well uh, with us. Uh, primarily it's a, because what we need is a continuous feeding system. So there are multiple uh, kind of pumps which can be used like so there is uh, peristaltic pumps as well which can be used if you want to do very fine printing because uh, the good thing with peristaltic pump would be that the life of the hose or the life of the peristaltic pump is quite higher compared to these progressive cavity pumps. So that is something which we are also working on uh, very rigorously but right now what we have is kind of a screw pump uh, kind of a continuous mixer coupled with the uh, basically a rotor stator pump, progressive cavity pump uh, provided by Amtech. Interesting. Is that for the gantry system and the robotic arm? Uh, for both. And I know there's some challenges when you're printing a small footprint uh, in terms of the layer time may only be a minute or two minutes, so the neck, it needs to be able to support the next layer without slump a lot sooner. Uh, does this lead to, do you use the same ingredients for the gantry system and the robotic arm system? Uh, we have like additives which we mm -hmm. use for different uh, uh, layer times primarily. So they are generally we operate within a layer to layer time of one minute to uh, three and a half to four minutes. That's where what we operate primarily in and there is a different additive range that we use when we are actually operating at one uh, minute per layer uh, versus uh, four minute per layer. So that's how we generally operate. And in the pumping system also, so with the Amtech pump that are available, so uh, there is one more thing that is uh, doable. Like you have different kinds of rotor stator assemblies available. So you can uh, change the rotor stator type, like it could have a lower uh, pitch. Uh, so the lower pitch would give you lower output or you could have a higher pitch. So higher pitch would give you a higher output. So that way also you can optimize uh, which pump uh, with the same uh, kind of uh, machine with different 
pumping uh, systems, pumping assembly for the same uh, machinery. I don't know if you saw, but Perry just announced they have some sensor that's an attachment to get uh, measurements of the material flowing through the hose. Uh, I imagine things like temperature, potentially pressure. Uh, can you imagine something like that being particularly useful? So uh, those kind of sensors would definitely be helpful because uh, when we are printing, let's say, 12 months uh, round the clock, so there are seasons where you have temperature like somewhere between 15 degrees Celsius in the winter in India and somewhere around 50 degrees Celsius uh, during the summer and then there are rainy seasons where the humidity is very high. So mm -hmm. the way material behaves is uh, actually very dependent on your weather condition. So it would de behave differently at 15 degrees Celsius and a very low relative humidity and it would behave very differently at a moderate temperature at very high relative humidity because the setting or the buildability depends on all those parameters. So it's good that if we put on sensors where we can measure what is the temperature, what is the relative humidity. Uh, so we can actually, uh, I would say, uh, modify the material in line uh, with those uh, things in place uh, so that our buildability rise that we want can be altered uh, as per the requirement or as per the climatic condition. Or another thing could be like if you want to uh, change the speed or if you want to change the output rate, let's say instead of like one ton per hour, you want to have just 200 kg per hour. So again, there you have to uh, kind of uh, change or alter the buildability or uh, how much additives do you want to add into the mix. So that way also these sensors would be helpful uh, definitely to have uh, in the system. But that is something which I think is, uh, yeah, uh, challenging uh, in sense because real time adjustment of uh, additives uh, is not very much real time. It would take certain time uh, since the material flows through the pipe. So, yes, uh, in a single batch, it's quite difficult. Like if in a single batch print, you want to actually alter the chemical composition of the material uh, in like each layer. So uh, there would be challenges in actually ascertaining. Uh, what, how the actual system would behave, how the actual 3D printed structure would behave. So that I think uh, definitely has to be studied. Is there a print you're working on right now? Uh, right now in the factory, yes, uh, they are printing. I am uh, at the other office. Uh, yeah. And is it a, are you allowed to say or is it a military project, private? Uh, actually, uh, normally I am uh, mostly uh, dealing with the client side, uh, so I have to travel a lot. So uh, there is, uh, the, our team actually is taking care of all the production at our uh, factory in Gujarat. So we are going to set up few more uh, across India as well. So three more factories are coming up shortly. Wow. So we are actually going to cater to various uh, regions of India. And is there a particular building project you're looking forward to? Uh, yeah, there are a few, yes. Uh, so we have recently completed like uh, few projects which are G plus one buildings as well. Like we recently completed uh, one tower for Air Force, uh, which actually is a runway controller hut. It's a watchtower uh, at the Pune uh, runway. We recently completed one another G plus one building uh, where like 64 men will be living. So 64 soldiers will be living in that uh, barrack primarily and that's built mm -hmm. at an altitude of around 10,000 feet. So that we recently completed another G plus one building we are doing uh, in Ahmedabad, which is a residential uh, building uh, uh, for defense again. And then we are also uh, doing one G plus three building uh, also. So where what we are doing is the basically the mode is like we have conventional uh, structure uh, like which is RCC and then we have the facade or wall panels using 3D printing tech. I always assumed the G nomenclature was about how many different units it was. Uh, like a G plus three would be a three unit apartment building, G plus five, no. five unit. What does it mean? No, actually G means, G means it's a ground story building. G plus one means it's a ground story plus first floor. Okay. G plus three means ground story plus three more stories on, on top of it. Now I understand. <laughs> Pretty simple. <laughs> Sorry, where were you going? Yeah, so yeah, so we actually have a lot of projects. So basically we have a lot of bunkers that we are building. So bunkers is something uh, I might not be able to show here because it's being recorded, but uh, offline I'll definitely show you uh, how it's done. So basically, yes, uh, bunkers is something where we have our expertise. So we have developed 
uh, impact and blast resistant bunkers. So basically we have developed bunkers which can withstand like uh, rockets, uh, like handheld rockets uh, can be withstood by our bunkers. Even the tank rounds can be withstood by the structures that we have built. So it's something uh, where we have actually done extensive testing on ground uh, at field uh, as well. So which actually has given uh, a lot of confidence to us that uh, yes, we are developing structures which can withstand. Uh, I would say the extreme, uh, extreme uh, impacts, extreme blast uh, that you can expect. Uh, so that's why we are very confident that yes, in the residential space, uh, we can, we are going to build very good structures. Yep. So in the beginning, when you founded the company, was the intention to go for military projects, or that happened along the way? Initially, the idea was to actually build bunkers because what we had been seeing uh, in India, like with defense, what they had been actually using was just they used to put sand in the bags and then they would put it one on top of each other and that's what the entire protection was that they were getting. So that was something which we always thought in mind that we that is something which we uh, are, we need to change. And we were very fortunate that we got to meet a few uh, journals from Indian Army and they saw the tech and they were quite uh, happy. And I would actually uh, like to thank Indian Army for their proactiveness uh, primarily because it's uh, if they would not have been that proactive, they would not have actually given us uh, chances for trials and errors. Like we failed like two times before developing the bunkers that we are delivering today. So there had been two failures that we did, but they still had the faith uh, in us and then they supported us uh, in that development journey. And uh, that's the reason why we are now actually strengthening the borders of India. Very nice. And so when you, to build the first printer, how did you get the funding to do that? Uh, so basically we received a lot of grants from various government agencies. So like uh, in India, there has been a great, uh, I would say, uh, motion, uh, Startup India, which has been driven by Honorable uh, PM Narendra Modi, uh, where he has actually, I would say he's a great visionary leader uh, who has ensured that uh, we need to be self-reliant, we have to be Atmanirbhar, as what we say. So uh, there has been a great push uh, to support uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, budding companies. Uh, through financial means and through whatever mentoring, networking support is needed. So in India, there is a great ecosystem now which has been developed where there are a lot of incubation centers, a lot of mentoring help is available where you can actually access, uh, you have access to great business leaders, you have access to funds as well. So through that, uh, we got our initial grants uh, through uh, like government of Gujarat, uh, Department of Science and Technology, uh, Ministry of Electronics, so through those funds, we actually were able to develop uh, our printing system uh, in a very short period of time. And then uh, with those funds, we were able to then uh, demonstrate that yes, we can develop certain products which are being valued by the client because it's at the end, it's about value creation. So whatever tech we have, we have to create value. Then only it will become a sustainable business. So with, with that thing in mind, uh, when the value was delivered, so we actually were fortunate to have some venture capitalists also to support us uh, in our journey. And now things are going uh, quite good and we are uh, going to scale up shortly. Yeah, India seems to be an ever improving environment for startups and entrepreneurship. Uh, has that been a new development uh, over time? Uh, you mentioned Modi had an impact on the entrepreneurial spirit. Definitely, uh, that I would say has been a great, there has been a phenomenal uh, shift in the mindset of the people, I would say, in the past, I would say, five to seven years. Uh, earlier, people were used to uh, uh, think of like, we should get a job which is secured. Now, people have a different mindset. Now, they actually are open to take risk in their early stages because uh, this is something uh, where you have to uh, also see that you have certain capabilities that you can, uh, I would say, uh, uh, skillfully develop into some creating something good. And uh, this risk taking appetite, I think, uh, has been created, uh, uh, environment has been created in Indian uh, ecosystem primarily. And there has been a great push from government side where they are supporting uh, various entrepreneurs through financial means, through other means as well. Uh, so, because if you, it has to be a calculated risk, like you cannot put everything just to create something. So when there is a support from government, when there is support from uh, other, uh, I would say stakeholders, uh, 
in the ecosystem definitely the young people would be more uh, encouraged to take risk and then uh, create good things uh, in the long run yeah and there has been a quite a good impact in this sense uh, in india like more than 100 unicorns uh, were there in the last year itself so that is uh, wow. something which is now coming uh, very i would say explicitly uh, in the open market open domain that india has a good potential uh, to develop very uh, cutting edge technologies uh, which are uh, market ready as well yeah definitely and there's so many people there as they all become uh i guess their work transforms to more technological things it increases the output uh, and the leverage that they get on their work uh it should be a really cool thing to see in the coming years so right now your primary client is the military and you're not looking to necessarily sell everybody a printer uh you're still working on some of the details but what does your ideal customer look like at this stage yeah so we are not uh, into that uh, we are not into uh, business of selling printers as on today uh, primarily because uh, what we felt is like if we want to sell a printer we have to kind of handhold them into developing certain things because uh things don't end at stopping printer uh, so there are a lot of things that you have to go through when you are uh actually selling a new technology which is not there in the market uh, as on today mm. but now things are changing in india now even government is actually recognizing that this is a tech which can be used for uh, regular construction so now even government is uh, floating tenders uh to specifically uh, build buildings using 3d printing technology so there has been a shift in the mindset of the governments as well but uh, our business strategy primarily has been to deliver products which are 3d printed so uh, in that sense what we are trying to focus on is to uh, kind of cater to market or cater to the clients uh, and solve their specific problems which can better be done using this technology so like uh, basically what we are focusing on is uh, products like bunkers are one products where we have ens- dev- uh, ensured that we uh can deliver bunkers which are relocatable which can be deployed on site in like one or two day earlier it used to take like 30 35 days to construct a bunker then we have shelters which can be deployed uh like uh, large shelters which can be constructed in like 10 to 15 days so this way we are creating certain value added products which have certain uh, advantage for the client so so that uh, they have to focus more on to uh, like how to uh, what added features they want so now what what we have in mind is like client or customer has to uh, come up with this requirement like what needs to be there and then we can come up with the solutions like and those solutions are something which are scalable like if we have developed bunkers this is something so there will be more than 10000 bunkers in india uh, like per year so if we talk about shelters so shelters are something which are required in bulk so this way what we are focusing on is to develop products which have a scalable size uh and the client is uh, there to help us into the development stage primarily uh, and we are not uh, focusing primarily on to creating houses because our ideology has been to actually solve problems because if you look at uh, housing uh, in general today so there are uh, like for people are also trying to do villas using this uh, technology so that has a separate market segment because uh, when an individual wants to have a house so his intent is like his house uh, should be unique or it should be built in a certain time frame so that's definitely uh, is one thing so that is something which can also be done by the conventional ones uh, anyways if you are going to build it using 3d printing tech it's going to cost higher at least in india as on today because the labor is quite cheap in india compared to uh, other countries so there we actually are not adding value for the customer because we are going to charge them higher because of the given constraints in india and then uh, ultimately uh, they have options primarily so where the clients have options they can uh, so there we actually be just competing with conventional on uh, because the structure would look similar or, or somewhat like that but we are trying to build something so where this tech has very unique uh, selling point where this product is something which is primarily uh, solving the pain points of the customer because otherwise they are actually not having a proper solution for those things so that way we are trying to focus on to developing some things using this tech which is going to solve certain critical problems for the country for the globe global level uh, in the next few uh, years 
as well so that's primarily what we are looking for and we are trying to create franchises now as well so so that we can uh, have uh, because uh, construction is a like a uh, trillion dollar market and we cannot actually uh, cater to all so in that sense what we are trying to do is because uh, selling a printer does not solve the problem so we have to educate them we have to train them and also we have to uh, ensure that we uh, maintain our confidentiality as well in the process so what we are looking is to actually uh, set up franchises across uh, nation at specific uh, locations as well so that uh, we can actually educate them we can have kind of uh, uh, knowledge transfer to them and then handhold them if they are in any uh, trouble so that's how we are actually going to uh, scale up uh, in the coming months and years that sounds like a very wise plan to me because the customer isn't just a regular customer it's an extended relationship so to be a franchise model and still maintain uh, a strong connection to your franchisees uh, it gives them some reassurance that you'll continue supporting them and uh, with franchises one good thing that we will have is that uh, they also have their certain area of expertise like let's say if uh, there is a builder who is going to be a franchisee then uh, he has certain set of uh, expertise with him available uh, in terms of construction field so we just have to ensure that we are giving him a, a specific technology which is useful for let's say 20% 30% of the entire thing rest he will be able to do by himself so that way we are uh, trying to make an impact on where this technology is going to have the highest uh, value addition you can measure by weight and say it's 80 <laughs> percent yeah but by realistically weight, 20 30. <laughs> fair enough but by value it would be lesser yeah the material usually is very expensive because of the high cement concentration right uh, I would say that has been one of our key differentiators in this segment. So if you look uh, at India, so India is something uh, which is a very cost sensitive market. So I, I have seen uh, some uh, like case studies uh, where the price of the house, I think you can let me know better like what is the current price of the house which is being 3D printed in UAE or uh, USA or Europe. I would usually give as a rough estimate it will be 40 percent more expensive than a traditional method in your region so construction costs in california could be double what they cost a couple states over in nevada uh but 40 percent is a pretty good rough estimate from people that have completed projects reported back with uh kind of whisper numbers so like uh, in california or nevada so let's say we want to build a thousand square uh, meter house or thousand square feet house sorry so what generally had been the cost and what is the cost with 3d printed structures nowadays maybe something like uh in nevada like 250 a square foot california like 350 or 400 a square foot uh, so what uh 350 a square foot dollars okay so Fine. 350k to build and that's cheap uh i don't think you can really build in california a thousand square foot house for 350k anymore uh, okay. So I would say that's uh, so in India. So 350k, I'll just convert it in rupees. So that's somewhere around 2.5 crores uh, for one uh, uh, thousand square foot house. In India, for thousand square foot, generally the cost is somewhere around uh, 35 lakhs. So that's almost eight to nine times higher in US. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you look uh, in terms of pricing, so the cement price, the steel price, so these are something which are global commodities. So the price of steel and cement is within the 10 to 15% range in US or in India. So, but still you can see the price at which the house is being sold in US is almost nine, eight to nine times higher compared to India. So you can imagine what, uh, cost sensitivity that we have to uh, cater to while actually working in mm -hmm. India because cement and steel is costing same so the primarily the difference is like labor and in 3d printing anyways you are uh, using very less labor but still the prices are that high so uh, the price wise we have to be very cost competitive uh, if we have to do projects in India so because the margins have to be uh, very cutthroat uh, if you are going to compete with conventional but yes, uh, so what we have been able to do is like we have been able to develop materials which are quite, uh, I would say, economical. Uh, because uh, if you look at the cost of the 
companies which are selling uh, the 3D print uh, 3D printed material right now is somewhere between uh, twenty thousand rupees. So I'll just convert it into. Give me a minute. Usually like three fifty, four hundred, six hundred a ton. Correct. Somewhere Correct. in that yeah. range. So three fifty something, four hundred rupees a ton is something. Uh, three three hundred dollars per ton is something which at which they are selling. And uh, we actually are uh, producing the same material at a cost of somewhere around fifty to fifty five dollars per ton. So that wow. has been the reason. But still, uh, they are using cement. We are also using cement. Uh, they are using sand. We are also using sand, and which are global commodities. So that has been the reason why we have been able to sustain in uh, such a cost competitive uh, environment like India. Yeah, I guess you're not using forty percent cement. Uh, no, <laughs> a lot of groups are. Yeah, true. Actually, using forty percent cement won't be sustainable in long because it won't be uh, complied as per any. Uh, norms i would say because using such a high cement content would lead to shrinkage in the long term so you won't see it today but like 5 years down the line you would start to see there will be shrinkage because cement is something which uh, has a tendency to shrink as it further hydrates and the hydration process is something which is a lifelong process for cement and uh, no code generally permits uh, more than uh, i would say 500 kg per cubic meter of cement so which is almost like 20 to 25% 20 to 25 maximum is the cement content that you can have in a uh, general concrete so 40 45 is something which is on a very high side and that is something which is of concern uh, that uh, people have to look into because otherwise there would be issues uh, which would be kind of uh, leading to shrinkage or some other effects as well interesting so the groups that are printing with 40% cement might end up with serious shrinkage in a few years there can be because that has been the reason if you see any global uh, codes uh, for like concrete so they definitely uh, are actually they are specifying a maximum cement content it's not like there has to be a minimum cement content yes that is there but there is also a limit on what is the maximum cement content can be there because mm-hmm. that has been uh, given a serious consideration over the decades because if you use a lot of cement content it's going to uh, go shrink down the line because when cement and water adds up the cement uh, the hydration product is something which has lesser volume so that is something which is a lifelong process so that needs to be considered definitely and then second most important thing uh, are the content of like alkali content what is the alumina content what is the a uh, sulfur content so these the maximum permissible limits have to be very critically uh, seen because uh, generally th- those have after effects because also the porosity so if you have the higher porosity in your mix like if the porosity of the printed concrete is like more than 7 to 8% <coughs> then uh, it would have susceptibility for chloride attacks sulfate attacks and when there would be rain so it can penetrate Uh, through the air voids or porosity of the concrete and then corrode the steel so which again would come up like 3 years 4 years 5 years down the line so these are some of the things which have so all the codes have been designed in such a way that uh, a due consideration thorough consideration had been given to all these aspects and then they have d- defined certain maximum limits lower limits so that is something which we also have to ensure that this is there in the printed concrete as well Yeah, I wonder if the 500 kg per meter rule applies to mortar in the same way it applies to concrete. I know a lot of the groups have used mortar instead. True. Yeah, but mort- mortars are normally not into the structural segment mm-hmm. primarily. Yeah, they are primarily for the plastering or pointing something like that. But here we are talking about things which have structural components made out of it. So are you pouring the same material that you're printing with into the columns with rebar? Uh, generally we do yeah wow and you extrude that from the printer yes interesting that sounds very expensive but i guess if your material is 55 a ton you can use it all the same yeah so material is like uh, fairly at the 10 to 15% cost of regular concrete in india i guess you probably it's your ip you don't want to give away the secrets but is there any way you can allude to how it's so affordable so that it can be more believable 
uh, i think you uh, the way we are doing projects in india at such competitive price and you can uh, i'll show you after this video like how these structures perform i think then you can believe uh, believe it and we are actually able to provide those structures uh with kind of a sustainable uh financial condition as well for us i guess a better way to ask that question if you sold a printer in the united states uh how would you figure out would you be able to ship the material or would it be better to get it locally it would be better to get the material locally because as i earlier said cement steel are something which are global commodities so if i buy cement in india or i buy cement in uh, usa so the price is within 10 to 15% range only mm. so in that sense it's not much different but still like if we are uh, getting like nine times the price compared to india it's definitely is something which is very profitable for us to uh, venture out in other countries that we will do uh, like later down the line once we have uh, our good uh, footprint established in india Yeah the nice part about working with the government is that they can help you with permitting which is a huge challenge uh how have you been overcoming that uh so primarily what we are doing is so uh, for the 3d printed structures so we have like designers with us so what we do <coughs> we do a first thorough structural analysis of the printed structure so we are actually moving into a hybrid kind of a model so in the hybrid kind of model what we are uh, doing is uh, if we have to uh, ensure that uh so in hybrid I, i'll talk about hybrid more so basically what we do all the structural components can be of conventional ones so through conventional means we are able to uh, actually make columns beams slabs of the conventional type <coughs> and then all the non load bearing components like the walls uh, can be made of the 3d printed ones so that way there is no issue uh, of uh, having a structural stability so those designs can easily be vetted so those are actually within the code compliance as well so that's how the 3d printing can be adopted uh, without worrying about that aspect because all the structural members are going to be the same so that's what our hybrid approach has been to take it to the mass level and then uh, comes the second part like when we are going to develop the entire structure using this tech so what we generally do is <coughs> we uh, first uh, get all the structural design uh, being vetted through Uh, the vetting agencies in india like uh, iits which are indian institute of technologies the professors of iits or the experts uh, in the 3d printing technology uh, who are working uh, with iits so they uh, are actually going uh, for a thorough analysis of the designs that we have made once they approve the design then we actually create our shop drawings for the uh, printing and that's how we are able to take it into the uh basically design consideration and then we get a third party checking third party vetting for the structural design and then from the client side also they have their <coughs> engineers or designers to check things what makes them 3d printing experts have they printed more than you uh it's not about printing so basically what we are doing is if you look at the structural part so <laughs> when you have to do the structural design you have to know bas- the basic parameters of the concrete uh, be it printed concrete or regular concrete so you have to provide them with all the details compressive strength flexural strength <coughs> its creep shrinkage all those parameters if you are providing them uh, for the perimeter part and the concrete which is used as a formwork and then the concrete which is used as the infill so and also when we uh, do the thorough testing cube testing core cutting testing so all those data is supplied <coughs> to them and then based on that they do the basically structural design analysis that's great so the academics they funded the research to get the data needed to figure out what makes a printed structure viable uh and yeah. they help you confirm that your buildings are strong correct and the good thing with defense is that they also have their in house testing so it's not like just we are going to like for example uh, for the bunker so what we did with bunker so we had this <coughs> initial development where the iit gandhinagar was involved uh, designers from indian army were also involved officers from army were involved and then once we built the structure then we did the field trial so it's not just we have did it uh, in papers or in softwares we have done field trials for uh, see whether it's able to uh, withstand those lateral loadings those blast loading impact loading so we have done thorough uh, trials on ground as well and then based on that we are then reverse calculating what needs to be optimized 
This is one of my favorite questions to ask, and uh, hopefully people aren't getting tired of it. I ask it a lot, but what does your company need the most right now to grow? What do the? What does your company, Miko, need the most right now to grow and reach your goals? Okay. Hmm. Uh, very interesting question. So uh, this is something which uh, now what we are looking for is uh, primarily uh, partners uh, because what we have uh, is expertise in 3D printing tech. <coughs> so 3D printing is uh, something which is uh, in terms of uh, volume of the project uh, if we are going to do would be something uh, like 30%, 35% of the entire project. But if we have to create buildings, if we have to create large structures, so there uh, a lot of other things are also involved and normally the clients uh, who actually are driving the growth story of a company so client wants a solution for the entire thing so what we are uh, at this stage have is a kind of a, a specific thing uh, which is providing 3d printed walls or 3d printed footing or whatever the system is but we have to provide a solution for in the entirety so that's where we actually are now uh, collaborating uh, with other kind of specialists who have that expertise so that they can be uh, kind of the pillar uh, who are supporting us in growth journey and then they have good capital available with them, they have good engineering resources, they have good execution team available with them because for us to scale up uh, really fast we need to have good men. So uh, for any organization to grow, it, it's all about the men you have. It's all about the men and women that you have. So it's all about people at the end, uh, their skill set, uh, their intent, uh, their passion. So that is something uh, uh, which is very difficult to find uh, and having all of them the same vision. So definitely uh, having that kind of um, skill set, having that kind of human resources, something which is quite challenging uh, if you want to scale up very fast. So that is where some partners uh, uh, who have that background are going to be something which are going to be very critical uh, in our growth story because then they can provide uh, the support in the things which we lack in terms of execution, in terms of uh, <coughs> planning, in terms of <coughs> doing very large projects because now the things are changing in India like uh, now government is also seeing that large structures can be done using this. So that way now what we will be focusing more on is to build more of our 3D printing capacity, build more and invest more on our R&D, create more sustainable products, create more efficient printing systems <coughs> and then we will uh, be partnering with uh, some uh, good construction companies who will uh, take care of all the other things uh, which are like almost 70-75% for a building mm -hmm. project. Yeah, integrating with traditional construction is a obviously critical part of building any kind of real estate. Do you have anyone with construction experience on your team? Yes, yes, we have. Uh, I also myself have like almost three and a half years of experience uh, in construction. Uh, we nice. have uh, a team of somewhere around, <coughs> uh, we have uh, 14 engineers uh, with us right now. Out wow. of them, like uh, six are from civil engineering background. Uh, we have a few project managers uh, with us. Uh, uh, we also have uh, consultants who are there for design consultancy as well, uh, for third party vetting as well. So this is how we are presently structured and we are going to uh, further scale up our uh, human resources uh, because we need to invest uh, a lot more uh, into further ensuring that the material is going to be better, the systems are going to be more robust and uh, the project management that we do. Uh, because now we have actually gone into a commercial stage, we are not uh, just uh, R&D into R&D or pilot phase, we actually are executing commercial contracts. So <laughs> things are now moving into the di that direction, so the structure, uh, we are uh, trying to bring more structure, more uh, better culture into the organization so that uh, we are able to meet the expectation of the clients and our partners. Mm -hmm. And so are you doing most of your building in Ahmedabad? Uh, right now, yes, as on today, uh, most of the buildings uh, are printed in Ahmedabad in our factory. Uh, but we are doing projects uh, like uh, as far as 2300 kilometers away. So we have done few projects which are almost 23, 2400 kilometers away from our location. On Still, the border? On border, yes, yeah. So yes, uh, we have been actually active across India. Like we have worked in the north, in the northeast, western zone, also in south. <coughs> so yeah, we have a wide uh, 
uh, I would say footprint now. But yes, uh, we uh, will be actually now uh, focusing more on setting up franchises so that the transportation cost <coughs> becomes uh, lower. Because in this field, uh, to make it mainstream, at the end, it's uh, all about cost effectiveness as well. <coughs> because for pilots, it's okay. But for uh, providing a sustainable solution, uh, it has to be cost effective. It, it cannot be very higher in terms of cost what conventional construction is providing uh, because ultimately it does not solve any purpose. Because, <coughs> so that's something which we are looking into uh, seriously. Yeah, I like to be patient with the cost thing because technology always takes time to, uh, to improve and there's so many people like yourself that are working on improving it and it seems to be making progress. Huh. Yeah, I, yes, uh, I am very hopeful and we, uh, we are very positive that this is something which is going to be uh, there uh, in a very large scale, for sure, in the coming years. Yeah, especially with the workforce, like young people all want to be like Elon Musk and want to work with engineering and work with their minds. It's hard to get young people to hold a hammer. Is that the case in uh, India as well? Uh, I would say no. Uh, people are still uh, okay uh, with that kind of laborious jobs uh, as well, if needed. So yeah, that's I, I think still uh, that is something uh, we have people uh, who are uh, ready to uh, do the dirty job if required as well. But yeah, that is something where technology is helping. Uh, technology is actually definitely helping the construction industry to move or shift uh, from the way it was uh, like few decades ago. So that is something where we definitely feel that this technology would uh, change the mindset uh, of the people. Like now women will be more involved in the construction domain as well because they can be operators, they can actually uh, do the designing uh, of the printed structures or uh, a lot of scope are there. So now it's not just a gender specific uh, kind of construction thing as well because in our factory we have human uh, women labor as well if uh, needed. So that's something yes that would change with uh, time. <clears throat> yeah, it's great because you don't need as much physical strength on the job site. Mm -hmm. You're you need uh, intellectual strength operating the systems and uh, yeah the builders in India how do they learn to build and uh, I know decades ago maybe longer it was like if your family's a builder you become a builder if your family's a doctor you become a doctor and so I imagine it was like through their families they would learn how to do the trade or uh, yeah, that family business kind of tradition definitely is there. But yeah, uh, now uh, like a lot of graduates are there in India uh, who have done their uh, graduation in like civil engineering. So they also are venturing this uh, companies or uh, ventures. Oh yeah, but those aren't the guys with the bricks in their hands. The, the, <laughs> more, uh, the masons and the like on-site jobs, the labor jobs, those are skills that need a training. Of course. Uh, true. So I think uh, in India there are, yes, uh, so skilled labor is something. <coughs> so there are some training schools uh, also mm -hmm. uh, in India where like certain skill sets are also uh, taught. There are industrial <coughs> training institutes where skill sets <coughs> for like plumbing, electrical, fittings, uh, mason. So those are taught as well. So it's not, I would say, something where only uh, it's a uh, the, if the father was doing this, the son would do, or uh, the daughter would do the same. So yeah, I mean, that things, mentality is old and outdated, right? Uh, that is still there, not totally uh, eliminated, but yeah, so the options are, opportunities are there, uh, where people have option to learn and then uh, choose a trade as well. Yeah, that's the beauty of entrepreneurship. Anybody can, it doesn't matter if they were a janitor, if they have a brilliant idea to come up with a startup, they can build a startup and become a unicorn. <laughs> True the best part about it the whole thing freedom yeah it won't be much of freedom if you are dealing with a lot of clients clients would uh, sometimes take up your freedom yes so yeah that's a I would say trade-off uh, it's not like just uh, you have full freedom because you have to ensure that the customer satisfaction is at uh, your priority uh, because uh, otherwise it's very tough uh, also to uh, I would say uh, rise up the ladder uh, in that segment yeah it's definitely not easy uh any business especially a new business where you're having to create things that haven't been done before 
Um, but it's exciting and it's fun to uh, see cool. all the progress. Yeah, that's definitely something which is very fulfilling, I would say, because when you are thinking something in your mind and the first time that you see uh, that it's done, it's created. So that's something which is very satisfying. Like uh, I'll share my personal experience when uh, uh, we first built our bunker and then tested it when the rocket launcher was just fired near me and I was able to see the feel, uh, I would say the hit or the blast pressure of wow. myself and then when it hit the structure and still it survived. So there was a kind of a feeling that was quite amazing and that has been, uh, I would say, I would say this, this way it has been very rewarding for me and my team as well because we have been able to interact with so many <clears throat> Uh, persons uh, down the line we have been able to interact with so many persons learn from them and then uh, it has been i would say very rewarding in sense we have been given the opportunity to create so that is something which we uh, are able to get uh, through this uh, startup mode because you can you have the power of creating something and uh, the ecosystem is enabling you as well so that is something which is very fulfilling as well but yeah, yeah it's so cool they let you watch I, that. I don't, I won't say <coughs> this is for, this is an easy, easy job. <coughs> so it's quite challenging, yes. <coughs> I think a lot of people get into it thinking that it's going to be, be press a button and the printer does all the work. <laughs> Maybe it will one yeah. day. Sorry? Maybe it will get to that one day. It, it should, it should, definitely, yeah. But still, there are a lot of uh, things that we have to keep check on. But yes, uh, with time, maybe there would be robots, AI robots, uh, which will be taking care of uh, like all the nuances, uh, the small things that we have to look into detail, like if the pump is choking up or not, if the pump is heating up too much. So there, like AI could help the robots, AI based robots could help uh, in the coming times. And if we are working in very extreme climatic conditions, geoclimatic conditions, again, there, uh, those AI robots uh, actually can help uh, in doing or working in those extreme environments as well. If it was, uh, if you solved concrete printing, what would you want to automate next? Uh, so now, uh, what we are uh, looking into is uh, primarily the metal printing part uh, also and uh, see how we can integrate uh, metal and concrete printing all uh, together. So that is something which we are working uh, also because that is something which would be quite interesting what we feel but that is a very difficult job, different job like having steel because uh, steel is a kind of a different, steel printing is a different thing. Either it can be <coughs> a fusion, fusion type of a thing, a welding type of thing or it can be a laser based uh, sintering of powdered material. So that, that's a to totally different thing but we are still thinking like how <coughs> we can uh, uh, basically or integrate or merge those two aspects together or the steel printing uh, or the metal printing could be a different domain altogether but that is something which uh, definitely would be quite interesting. Uh, yes. You might start printing in metal in the future, that could be really cool. Uh, yeah. Back to concrete for a second or maybe some other materials like adobe, geopolymers. Uh, are there other materials that you think of or are, are considering hemp maybe? Uh, we actually are working on marine structures now uh, because we are cons uh, also working on floatable structures uh, that are that is actually next uh, on our list. Uh, now we are actually working with various uh, aggregates, lightweight aggregates as well uh, and incorporating those uh, in our material because <coughs> When we are developing the, these structures uh, in a prefab mode, so one critical uh, problem or one thing <coughs> which is having a financial implication is the transportation cost. And if we are able to reduce that by utilizing lightweight aggregates uh, in a sustainable manner, so that is something uh, which would be quite helpful. And mm -hmm. then <coughs> for marine environment, uh, we are also working on developing products uh, which are actually going to be sustainable in marine environments as well uh, given the very harsh conditions that we have in marine uh, areas uh, and there is a lot of requirement uh, across uh, the marine because a lot of population is living across the marine areas and there are a lot of challenges that uh, we have uh, in offshore and onshore structures so that is something uh, which we feel uh, would be our next uh, target uh, in terms of product range that we can create using uh, this tech. <coughs> and would the intention of that project be to grow reef around it? 
Uh, not Reef. Uh, as on today, we are more focused on uh, products which are directly, uh, I would say, involved with the human population, like uh, products or projects which have kind of some uh, direct usage uh, for uh, human or uh, maybe jetties, boats, uh, those kind of things that we are working on, not the reefs. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that is something which we would uh, definitely wish our franchises would do uh, when we will be creating those. <laughs> yeah, other groups have done some reef projects and it's interesting because the yep. all of the calcium, I believe, in the mix makes it very suitable for uh, a reef to attach onto or something. Uh, and they've done some pretty cool, intricate curves so that the little fish can escape the big fish. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Experience Highway did it. Yeah. yeah, there's a couple of different groups that are doing it. Uh, yeah. The uh, Your Marine Projects will be jetties and boat, not an actual boat, like a boat dock. A dock primarily. So mm-hmm. jetties, embankments, uh, those kind of floatable structures uh, onshore, uh, offshore as well. So that's something which we are now also working on. Does it change the necessary parameters much? I know concrete tends to cure better underwater. Uh, that's a different water altogether. It's a saline water, so the things are quite different there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the mix has to be totally different in a marine environment where the salinity is quite high. Uh, the type of reinforcement that you use has to be uh, considered very carefully, like steel corrodes. Like in a year, you can see the steel rod being corroded uh, completely. So that's a quite different environment, uh, yes, altogether. So that's a different product line, definitely, <clears throat> which has to be very thoroughly uh, studied and then developed. One thing we didn't touch on that uh, the last group printing from India mentioned is that the construction labor there can sometimes be unreliable. And so it's a huge benefit of 3D printed construction that you're not having to uh, trust a construction crew to use the right size rebar or the right amount of rebar. Uh, there's been some like unpredictable building failures that could be eliminated with printing. Uh, I would say at the end when we are actually doing any project, any large project, so <clears throat> there are engineers, there are supervisors, uh, side engineers who actually do a very thorough check. Uh, when the reinforcement is put in, when the concrete is poured in, so I think uh, a lot of things are done very uh, cautiously. Uh, like I have been into the construction field as well. So they, from a contractor's point of view, uh, the contractors do a very thorough check. And then from the client side as well, the clients do a very thorough check. So generally it's <clears throat> it's taken care of uh, very seriously. Uh, like uh, And labor's uh, shortage, I would say that is something uh, which is there, but That's not a very big challenge as such because uh, we are able to mobilize the human resource uh, here in India. And uh, given uh, regarding the quality, that is something which is of utmost importance, definitely. But there can be cases, uh, I I cannot deny those as well, but generally uh, 99% of the time, the construction uh, has like two-fold checks, one from the contractor side, one from the client side as well. So issues that the V-bars are less or the concrete is of low quality should not be there generally in the construction. <clears throat> in that aspect, I don't think concrete printing, uh, because already the quality is good there as well, because we have built like Burj, Burj Khalifa. So it's not like we have poor quality of construction. Uh, in India also, we have very uh, tall structures. We have monumental structures in India as well. So <clears throat> there has been a very, uh, I would say the contractors, the builders have been very Uh, thorough have been very diligent uh, in building the structures and uh, we have created a lot of good structures but there can be issues but that's i I would say hardly one percent less than one percent the case that's good to hear i asked because i wanted to get another perspective on it i just heard that one guy maybe that was just his own life experience so it's good to hear that uh you had a different experience but it's a i was looking at it almost as a competitive advantage for 3d printed construction so uh, yeah, actually, it has certain competitive advantage. So basically, what we are saving on, if we look at 3D printed walls versus uh, conventional walls, so we actually are saving on the formwork primarily if we are considering a concrete wall. If that's a brickwork, we are not saving on any formwork. But if it's a brickwork, it's going to have very high heat transmission. Whereas in printed concrete, we can have uh, voids inside. 
so compared to a brick masonry wall we can have very better insulation uh, <clears throat> that's something which is useful uh, if it's a concrete wall so in concrete also there are solutions available like there are hollow core wall panels available uh, which are available to the market but the challenge is that those are primarily rectilinear so if somebody wants to build a rectilinear building so he should better go with those hollow panels hollow concrete panels which are readily available in the market the cost would be lesser so it's better to go with that but if somebody wants to have some specific design in mind where you need those detailing and those are something which are functional requirement then it makes more sense to go with this tech so i think now client has a good option available with them that they can have uh, they can either go with the conventional if actually that fulfills their uh, functional requirement or they can go with the 3d printing tech if uh, that is solving more of their purpose one thing which i definitely see uh, is that 3d printed buildings would have better energy efficiency definitely in the long term so that is something which uh, we feel is something which will definitely uh, reduce the energy loading uh, of the building uh, plus because the materials uh, can be optimized in such a way that we use very less material so again uh, during construction phase as well the carbon footprint of a building would be very reduced so that way definitely it's something which is going to be something uh, very sustainable in in the coming years yeah definitely there's some circumstances especially when you introduce curves or anything like that custom shapes would be very challenging to get a traditional builder to to do yeah, so but for let, let's say a mass housing project if you want to do mass housing at a cheap price so better mm -hmm. to go with the hollow core wall panels if you can because you have a solution available there but if you want to do specific curves specific things where the you need those detailing so have a mix of those have a mix of both so i always say that it's better to use best of all the words instead of just <coughs> putting something uh, onto uh, uh, like just for the name sake yeah true true the is there a product that you have, like a smaller product that people, uh, like tables, furniture, do you ever do stuff like that? Actually, we started uh, with furniture. Uh, when we started MyCorp, then we uh, were not able to actually get in touch with defense because that is very uh, kind of a closed market uh, as such. But now things are changing. <coughs> so we started uh, our journey with creating a custom furniture, custom made furniture, bespoke furniture. Uh, we sold a lot uh, in Ahmedabad, Gandhinagar region and some in other cities of India as well. But then once we <coughs> got uh, like uh, in touch with defense and we saw that there is a serious pain uh, that is there, uh, a serious issue that needs to be resolved. So <coughs> since then we have focused our entire energy uh, into that segment to ensure that we are solving a critical problem uh, that otherwise uh, is something which is not uh, being solved. So yes, uh, definitely uh, outdoor furniture is something, landscaping things are something which uh, can be done uh, through this mode and we would definitely would uh, be venturing into this but not directly as on today but through the franchises that we want because uh, we have been in, <coughs> asked by a lot of architects, a lot of other builders who are willing to uh, create these things so that's where we <coughs> would, would develop a franchisee model where we would educate them, handhold them on to creating those things so that they can uh, enter into that market and then uh, create the space. You mentioned in the short term you'll be setting up three workshops. Are those all franchise workshops? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? You mentioned you'd be setting up three workshops. Uh, we will be setting three <coughs> factories, uh, another factory. So like we presently have one factory in Gandhinagar. <coughs> That's a <coughs> around 45,000 square feet uh, area for wow. our manufacturing. And now we are going to set up uh, like three such more units uh, at other locations, strategic locations primarily, uh, from where our inward raw material costing almost becomes zero. So mm. anyways, otherwise you would have to uh, bear the outward raw material cost. So that way the cost of uh, production would further go down. And those next factories, are they franchise factories or they're fully owned by Miko? They will be owned by us. Mm -hmm. So is the franchise option available right now for people? Uh, we are structuring the model right now. Uh, so that's still in legal phase. So we are mm -hmm. structuring that uh, very diligently. So in next, uh, I would say one or two months, uh, we will be uh, going with that. <coughs> nice. That's pretty short. And the, what's the timeline on the factories? 
uh, factories would be set up like in six months down the line from today. That's short too. Awesome. So you'll need uh, a lot more printers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what? How long does it take you from the time you intend to build it to get all the parts together, assemble it? Uh, generally, uh, two and a half months to three months max. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been tough lately with shipping and all the people order a printer. It, it, it sometimes takes like a lot longer to get there uh, because shipping's just been totally unpredictable the past couple of years. <laughs> True. But yeah, generally, uh, like, uh, uh, it does not take more than a month in general. <clears throat> Once you have everything together. Sorry? Once you have all the parts together. Once we have all the parts together, it would take us a week to get oh, wow. it function. Yeah. <clears throat> I guess you're assembling the extruder, the control booth, uh, maybe making some changes to the mixer pump. A few, a few. Like we have our software, which is kind of compatible with multiple robots, KUKA, ABB, uh, also Fanuk. Nice. Uh, so, so that way we are actually able to reduce the time frame as well. Uh, and then uh, we have all the assemblies made for the extension or the I would say basically the extrude end part. Uh, so that way things are very standardized uh, at MyCob now, uh, so that it's uh, easier for us to uh, start uh, with the new machine. Do you have a preference? Trying to create structure and standardization so that that's something uh, which would be very helpful for our franchises. So that is something which we are very focused on to uh, have standard operating procedures, have structures. Uh, so those are the things. Uh, have a training module so those are the things which will be very critical for the franchises to be uh, kind of uh, profitable uh, when they operate when they start operating yeah that's very important the, the machines you prefer KUKA or ABB FANUK yeah what? ABB KUKA FANUK FANUK okay yeah so ABB Kuka definitely uh, would be uh, something which we would like to have. So right now we have Fanuk robots with us. So we uh, actually went oh. with all the three and then uh, went ahead with Fanuk. And we will be uh, having a few from Kuka and ABB as well shortly. <clears throat> Is there what makes the one you chose your preference? Uh, we did a bit of uh, like comparative study when we bought the kind of uh, robotic system. Fanuk I won't say much because that is something all three are good, definitely. So all mm -hmm. three, I would say, have almost similar specification. Sometimes it boils down to the cost as well, uh, when the performance is similar. Yeah, it makes sense. They all just move X, Y, Z axis. They go where they're told. And as long as you're continuously flowing material through uh, the hose, hopefully everything goes well. Does Do you have any kind of hopper at the extruder head? Uh, right it's now, just... no. It's simply uh, pouring from the uh, nozzle as on today. That's nice because it's so much easier to clean. Yeah. The uh, complicated screws and stuff, power washing, the uh, everything adds another hour or two to the end of the day. It's tough. Yeah, true. What's your cleaning process like? Uh, it's quite simple. Uh, basically, once the printing is done, uh, we just have to kind of wash with water and then you have to pass a specific ball, sponge ball, which cleans the hose and then you can just clean up the basically chamber of the pumping system where the water is mixing with the material. Uh, that's a very uh, straightforward method. So somewhere around 20 minutes you take to clean up the entire system. <clears throat> cool. I saw you're hiring a CTO uh, or sorry, CFO. We have a CTO. CFO. Yeah, yeah, yes. And what's the, what are you looking for in your CFO? Uh, basically now uh, these are the things, uh, because we are now moving into more commercial stages, like now we are actually having bigger orders. So having a very thorough uh, planning, ha having a very thorough uh, cost control on the projects, uh, that is something which is very important now. Similarly, uh, we have to be very uh, cautious about the uh, models for franchising. Uh, so those are also mm -hmm. some of the things that 
uh, he has to uh, or she has to be very diligent on and then definitely uh, how to ensure the working capital finance uh, or other modes of finance uh, that is something uh, which uh, needs to be uh, taken uh, in consideration and we have to ensure that uh, we remain profitable so a lot of things uh, are there which a good cfo can actually help us uh, in cutting down the cost uh, when we have a detailed uh, kind of uh, information available with us uh, in a very right manner so yes uh, that is something which is very critical so if that person is listening right now or maybe somebody wants to be your customer or work with you what's the best way for them to contact you uh, they can uh, drop an email to me uh, that's uh, email is available at the uh, website of my call definitely that'll be at the link in the description and uh, the is there places you guys are on social media where should people follow you uh, yes, uh, we are on Facebook, uh, we are on LinkedIn, uh, also on Instagram, and I think we are also going to be on Twitter uh, as well shortly. <clears throat> Is uh, There's no TikTok in India, right? It's. I think it, it's banned in India. It was banned around a year back. Yeah. Maybe smart. I don't know how good uh, <laughs> TikTok <laughs> is for people, but uh, yeah, it's great. It's surprising sometimes. Just a silly little video could get a lot of algorithm traffic on Instagram or Facebook or something, and you never know who might find out about 3D printed construction that way from you. Actually, uh, the response has been quite good. So uh, we feel bad when we have to say no to somebody uh, uh, who is actually willing to do uh, a project. So that's why we are not publicizing much. So mm -hmm. we are actually, because we already have like a lot of orders uh, with us, and we are we have a strategy to scale uh, at a certain level as well uh, to ensure that we still uh, are able to control the expansion because if we expand too fast so that is something which we have to be very cautious about as well uh, we should not be into uh, like i would say is let things go out of control so that's something uh, why we have been a bit i would say uh, restricted in terms of uh, very high publicity uh, that we have been uh, doing in the past so yes we are trying to slowly, slowly uh, uh, build our brand, uh, ensure that we are creating products which are sustainable, which are creating value. And once the things are in place, once our, all the things, structures are in place, and then like uh, two, three months down the line, when we are ready for franchising, then we will definitely uh, take it uh, on a grand level. Yeah, that really gets me thinking. About, I mean, some groups have done so much focus on marketing, uh, and they love to brag that they have a list of 5,000 people that want homes. And yet they've only built like one or two in the past three years. So what's the point of having a waiting list of 5,000? Uh, Actually, that's I, I feel is a bad marketing. Uh, if, yeah. If we publicize too much and if we are not able to <coughs> respond back, deliver to clients, it's something yeah. at the end which uh, the client won't turn back. And uh, he he might say that, oh, my cob, they don't answer, they are not able to do it. So that's something which we have been very cautious about that we have to take in plate only so much that we can eat uh, comfortably. <clears throat> yeah, well, luckily this podcast doesn't get too many views. It's just a few <laughs> dedicated uh, people, so they, it, they won't flood your inbox, but they should be productive conversations. Actually, I was quite excited to uh, have the podcast with you, so that was the reason. I thought, yeah, definitely, uh, it would be, uh, I would love to discuss with you in detail uh, what we are doing. And, like, we are trying to uh, uh, shortly then uh, do the expansion, so definitely I think it's the right time uh, for us as well. Yeah, thanks. I was excited for it, too. I'm uh, just trying to have a library because I see, like you see, construction is going to change. And so I want to capture the story of the people making the change. <laughs> Yeah, so I just li love all your podcasts, definitely. So that, that has given me a lot of insights on uh, how things are changing in 3D printing space and other uh, construction tech as well. So that has been quite useful. Uh, and I'll definitely appreciate your efforts uh, that you have put into actually bringing uh, all the players that who, uh, who are working on this field uh, on this platform. Yeah, thanks. I'll keep doing uh, my thing. You keep doing your thing and we'll uh, add more chapters to this story. Sure, definitely. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you for joining me today. It's the the first of many podcasts we'll do together. And uh, once you get those factories up, uh, let's do another one. Sure, Jared. Thank you. <clears throat>